The Canadian government is calling China to the World Trade Organization. It wants the two sides to formally meet there to try to resolve a dispute over canola. If talks fail, Canada can request a ruling from a WTO panel. Since March, China has blocked imports of Canadian canola seeds, alleging inspectors found pests in some shipments. Efforts to send a delegation to see the evidence have failed completely, let alone efforts to simply talk about it with the Chinese. More than 43,000 Canadian farmers grow canola. Are they encouraged by this latest step? Brian Innes is the Vice President of Public Affairs at the Canadian Canola sorry, Council of Canada, rather, and he joins me from Ottawa. Hi, Mr. Innes. Nice to see you. Thanks for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. Is this a positive step? What's your perspective? It is a positive step. It's not one we took lightly. Uh, as an industry, our, our first priority is to regain access to the market. But unfortunately, until this point, we just haven't had engagement with China that would help, help us understand why their actions would be justified. And so we really need to take this step uh, to sit down in Geneva uh, between Canada and China and understand what the justification is for their blockage of our canola. Paint me a picture if you can. We've had the minister on, Minister Bebo, many times to ask about this dispute. She seemed to indicate that there was a big effort to try and get some sort of technical team over there to see the evidence that the Chinese claim existed. It, it never happened. How, what were the efforts like behind the scenes to try and resolve this prior to sort of dropping this point? Well, that's right. So since March, there's been a lot of efforts made by both the government and ourselves as industry, uh, really trying to understand why the Chinese have taken these actions. Uh, unfortunately, despite those efforts, there's been some exchanges, but no real um, significant evidence that would explain how their actions are justified. So whether that's uh, for conference calls or meetings, there just has not been the information shared by China to explain how they can be consistent with their WTO obligations. So it's very frustrating for our industry six months now since when it started and, and prices of courses have been affected which mm -hmm. has an impact on everybody in the industry our 43,000 growers but the whole industry right across Canada. I want to ask about that impact in a second but just on those bilateral consultations the efforts with the WTO any concern that China won't even participate? Well, there is a concern, but China has also uh, been a productive member of the WTO. In fact, they've also recently um, brought similar measures against other countries uh, at consultations. And so we're, we're very hopeful that this step um, will help uh, the two countries come together in person in the same place uh, in a way that we've been requesting uh, for a number of months now. Uh, so we, we believe that this will be, be helpful and if it isn't, well, we, we don't have any choice but to uh, really pursue our, our rights under the WTO. You mentioned you've been requesting this for a few months. Saskatchewan Trade Minister Jeremy Harrison said the move by the federal government was months overdue. Do you agree with that? Well, one thing that we know as industry and farmers especially is that the time is really important. So when we look <laughs> at... a prop! <laughs> well, this is canola. You know, a lot of Canadians don't know what canola looks like. But, but canola uh, is a really important part of farm income and it's important for farmers and communities across the country. And every day that goes by that our prices are affected impacts the ability of farmers to invest and, and also processing facilities to invest in their communities. So right now is a good time. Um, we want to make sure that we're taking the steps necessary. China was asked these questions in May, and so we're very appreciative that now finally uh, this formal request has been made and we can get together in the same room and understand uh, what is the basis for China's actions. I guess my question though is do you think that formal request comes too late? Would you have rather it come earlier than this? From our perspective, things are complicated. So when we talk about China's rights and obligations, every country has a right to protect their plant health, but they also have an obligation to make sure that the things they're doing are the least trade restrictive possible. And it's taken some time to, to make sure that we're asking the right questions of China. So for example, that means that when China says that pests are a problem, are those pests actually in our canola shipments? And we're uh, certainly not uh, agreeing that that's the case. Are, are, if those pests are indeed present, are, are they not also present in China. And then finally, uh, is it really a risk to China if those pests go to China when our canola goes to processing plants surrounded by concrete that are hundreds of kilometers away from where canola is produced in China? So those are the things that, that take a lot of detail uh, to really understand, and it's taken a number of weeks and months uh, to get to this point, but today's a very good day to move forward. And I understand all the, the technical arguments that you're laying out, and I'm sure you're aware there's a, a political discussion occurring as well. There are many who assume uh, that, that this is being done in retaliation for the arrest of Huawei CFO, Huawei executive 
uh, Meng Wanzhou. There is a new chi ambassador to China that has just been appointed, Dominic Barton. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to talk to him or anyone from the industry has and how uh, optimistic you are, if at all, that he will be able to, to move the ball forward. Dominic Barton's a great choice as ambassador for Canada to China. He knows the agri-food sector really well. He knows uh, how the agri-food sector is an engine of growth for Canada. We haven't spoken to him since the announcement, but uh, we have had interactions with him before. And hopefully, uh, with uh, once he gets firmly established in Beijing, he'll be able to take up this file. We had positive experience as well with former Ambassador McCallum, and we're very uh, looking forward to what we can do with Ambassador uh, Barton. Before I let you go, Mr. Innes, you mentioned some of the, the impact. Can you quantify for our viewers what has happened since this ban to your industry? I, I understand prices are down 10 percent. Well, prices are down 10 percent, and so for our industry, that represents a billion dollars of income that's not coming into the Canadian economy over a year. Uh, that's money that farmers aren't spending. Uh, we really see an opportunity to, to uh, not just fix this issue, but to be able to diversify at home and abroad. Uh, we want to see an opportunity to increase the use of canola and biofuels here in Canada, as an example, and really diversify by getting better access to Asian markets. So uh, we want to be able to increase the value that of canola that's coming and diversifying at home and abroad is a way to do that and that helps Canadians right across the country whether it's um, folks in the services industry they're providing accounting or finance or, or uh, engineering services to the agri-food agri industry or the people who are directly involved in communities right across the country. All right thank you so much Mr. Ennis appreciate your time this evening that's Brian Ennis of the Canola Council of Canada thank you. Thanks. We're back with the power panel, Paul, Marika, Marie, and Aaron. Canada is asking the World Trade Organization for a bilateral consultation with China over its ban on our canola shipments. This comes the day after confirmation that Canada and China's new envoys have been approved and on the heels of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's blunt comments about China's use of arbitrary detentions as pressure tactics. Uh, Marie, why don't I start with you? Th this is kind of an interesting, I mean, we've talked about China a lot, but it, it's been an interesting week of developments that culminated in today's announcement. Uh, the Conservatives and some provinces like Saskatchewan had been asking the government to take this to the WTO for a while. It appears like they did take it, but now they've raised it to a new sort of public level. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea economically, only for the fact that Usually when Canada goes to the WTO against the United States anyway, I didn't, you know, go back to look at every single decision that has happened in the history of the world, but usually when we go up against the United States on things like uh, softwood lumber, we usually win. So it might not be a bad strategy. Then there are people who wonder, is it a good idea, given that we have two Canadians in jail, and should we really be, you know, upping that part of the, uh, uh, of the fight with China, given we're trying to fix the other part of it? But... I, I think we're finally maybe in a bit of a better position in the sense that China actually agreed to give uh, Mr. David Barton agreement. They actually welcomed his nomination, which, you know, is a little step up from where we were a few months ago. Uh, and China also said they saw they viewed it as a as as a, him having a positive role in promoting a bilateral relationship between China and Canada. Diplomacy is all about choice of words. Uh, I don't think it's it's uh, uh, an accident that they use those words to, to qualify a positive uh, move by Mr. Barton now being named ambassador. And what experts have been saying all along is that you can't necessarily just stop any recriminations against China because they have our two Canadians, because essentially you would be, you know, bowing to their, uh, th those are not my words, but experts' words, you would be bowing to a hostage-taking diplomatic strategy or, 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 or a way of doing policy. And so you still have to criticize him, like Christopher Freeland did on the Hong Kong situation. Is it going to, I mean, is it going to hurt or help the relationship? I feel like at this point it's pretty much stalled, at best going a bit better. I, I think anything that we do will anger China. I think they didn't really have a choice at, at, at this point to try and escalate things to try and fix one part of the situation. Aaron, we know that for months, as long as this conflict with China and the impact on the canola industry has, has been taking place, the government has not had much luck in even getting someone on the other end of the phone. Specific to this issue, we've interviewed Minister Bibo many times who said they can't even get a technical team over there to sort of try and uh, denounce what the concerns are over the quality of the product, that kind of thing. Uh, is it a, uh, do you think this escalates things? Is there a risk involved in it or do they really not have a choice? 
I mean, I, I guess there is a slight risk that China goes ahead and does something else now uh, as retaliation. But the, the liberals are going into an election campaign and they're facing the charge from the conservatives that they're not right. serious on China, that mm -hmm. they're too weak. Uh, and this is something the prime minister has been particularly, it's particularly vulnerable to since the India trip. Uh, and so, to a certain degree, so if you're accused of being not tough enough and not serious uh, and not taking enough action, well, you, you know, you kick it to the WTO and then you go out and get Dominic Barton to be your ambassador. Uh, it, it, All in one week. Yeah. <laughs> right before the Ritz. It's almost yeah. like there's an election coming. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know that it, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't solve their problems. Uh, you know, if you assume that the China, the entire China situation is down to uh, 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 an executive who is under house arrest, then, then until that situation is resolved, nothing gets resolved. But it does, it, it does, it does at least counter the idea that they have been sort of unable or unwilling to do anything uh, up till this point. Yeah, in the context of the election, Paul, does it change the ability of the Liberals to fight back on that point? Can they say, hey, there's an ambassador now, hey, we went to the WTO, even though the, the and, 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 you know, the Conservatives have been saying for months, this is what you should be doing. We've interviewed Minister Bibo on that again, and she hesitated to. She didn't want to escalate it at the point. Now they've decided the point has arrived. Uh, does it allow the Liberals to sort of be able to say, we, we aren't weak on China? Um, a little bit. I, the, the choice of Dominic Barton is an interesting one. Uh, he's been, he's, he's a, a, a globally famous consultant guy uh, who's been uh, very pro-China uh, forever. Uh, um, and, and he represents um, one side of a, of a debate that, that um, every Canadian has to think about, which is, is China basically the future and we have to get on side with China? Mm. Or is China basically antagonistic, not only to Canadian interests, but to Canadian values? And we have to, at some point, uh, agree to disagree in pretty forceful terms. Uh, Barton, uh, his his brief over the next little while is to um, fight tooth and nail for the release of these two hostages. Mm -hmm. um, but everything, his, his philosophy of China very much has been for a long time that China is the future and that Canada's got to get on board. Um, I, I think to some extent his selection represents nostalgia for the days when Canada could believe that it had a... Um, a, a, a kind of an evangelical role in making the China of tomorrow. Uh, and I think that's naive at best. How do you think this issue plays out, Marika, in the election? I, I think that's the key, is this timing does put something in their toolbox to show to the electorate, especially to farmers in the prairies who are feeling left out for many reasons or neglected for many reasons. I think this shows that they are, at least in a symbolic way in the short term, fighting for their efforts and and I think the ambassador also as you mentioned plays into that that it gives them a rebuttal that I don't think they had a week ago. Do you think this issue is an issue? Do you think Marie that that this is even something that's going to be particularly important to Canadians? I mean the detainment of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor has been top of mind. It's certainly talked about quite often. Uh, do you think it's something though that uh, that will be you know a, a point of interest in this campaign? I think foreign affairs are rarely a point of interest in an election. Uh, broadly, yes, you know, but I, 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 I think elections are rarely decided on foreign affairs files unless something really happens, mm. uh, uh, some sort of escalation, and then perhaps like I would be proven wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure. And then I agree with Marika that this does um, kind of send a message to reassure farmers. Unfortunately, those farmers are probably in writings that won't vote Liberal anyway. So I think it takes away arguments from the Conservatives that, that Mr. Trudeau has been weak against China. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that's a big vote swinger. Aaron, do you think, I mean, the, the, the Conservatives' line very much in the last month has almost cemented when, when foreign policy is concerned to failure, 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 weak, weak, weak. Do you think that message has traction? It could. Uh, look, I, I think Marie's right that foreign affairs is rarely a huge issue in uh, a Canadian federal election. Uh, that said, this has been a pretty uh, interesting and unique period in, in world history over the last four years, <laughs> and that may change things. Uh, you know, there are going to be questions about uh, who do we want uh, against Trump? Who do we want uh, on China? Who do we want dealing with whatever's going on in Europe these days? Uh, and so it could to that degree play into it. And Trudeau has, has managed to put himself in a, in a spot where he can, he, can, he can say, look, I handled Trump and I, uh, you know, we got mm -hmm. NAFTA to a, a peaceful uh, resolution. Uh, and he should be able to claim credit for that, but there are those pictures from India. And that, the, the, the pictures from India will continue to undercut that idea that he is a serious, uh, tough, 
uh, you know, heavyweight who can deal with, with, with the world. For all the acclaim that he has received from the international press, the Rolling Stone cover, et cetera, et cetera, that India trip and, and various other disputes and the, and the pre-existing sort of notion that he was not ready uh, is going to make it, is, is going to be something that he has to fight to a certain degree in this election. The only right. problem, though, on NAFTA, the, which, I, which I would just uh, say really quickly, is that when he says that Justin Trudeau was weak, that he should have gotten a better NAFTA, that he didn't stand up to Trump enough, well, Mr. Follow Scheer's up, predecessor kind of said that he actually did a pretty good job on NAFTA. So that might take Ms. away Ms. Ambrose a bit of you're talking about, right? Yes, Ms. Ambrose, yeah. Uh, Ronna Ambrose, yeah. yeah. Marika, what do you think? Yeah, I think that the 2015 election actually really showed us how international events can have a big impact on elections. When we saw that Alan Kurdi picture of the Syrian refugee who drowned, that completely changed the narrative of the election. It it changed the trajectory of the election. And so, again, there's always that caveat, right? Events. And that could make things like the Monk debates really important for Trudeau or... As per usual, foreign affairs will, you know, take a back seat to domestic affairs in an election. Paul, final word to you. Um, what Justin Trudeau has learned as prime minister is that a, even a, a popular photogenic prime minister can't repeal the laws of physics. On the narrow issue of Spavor and Kovrig, the important issue of Spavor and Kovrig, they made a big strategic choice, which was important and I think right, which is to not allow candidates to be bullied mm -hmm. and isolated. All of those leader calls he made to uh, heads of government and state around the world to get them to not say that this is a, uh, a bilateral dispute between the two countries, but that this is a clash of values in which China is clearly wrong is exactly what China was hoping wouldn't happen. Um, and yet they're still captive, and yet, and yet the Chinese regime is still not talking to us about, about that. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's extraordinarily frustrating, and it would be for any prime minister. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much to our power panel tonight, Paul Wells, Marie Vestel, Marika Walsh, and Aaron Wary. Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos, host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video. Thanks for watching.